All right, uh, first is a reminder to everybody, uh, November 16th, 23rd, and 30th, those Wednesdays, uh, we'll be gone to Arizona and California, so no class on those days. Uh, and we're going to get into um, this lesson, which is one of my favorite lessons. One of the reasons it's one of my favorite lessons is because covering the life of Herod the Great is, um, it, it brings out information about a character you guys have heard about and heard about and heard about but you realize how little you've often known about him. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of times I've heard, you know, preaching on things when it gets to Herod the Great, uh, you know, you get to Christmas, you know, seasons and they say stuff about Herod and they go on about Herod and they just, they don't fully grasp who it is that they're talking about and uh, the reputation in life that he had. Um, it's still a great desire of mine that they would someday make a uh, a series, a Netflix series, or one of those streaming series on the Herods. It would outdo Game of Thrones by far. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating to with the drama of the actual, this is Julius Caesar, this is Caesar Augustus, this is, uh, you, you've got Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, they're all mixed in with all of this. It, it, it would be an absolutely amazing uh, um, series. Uh, again, I hate suggesting it to anybody because they'll probably ruin it. But uh, it is—it's a—it's an amazing story of his life. So where we left it last week uh, is that you had the Hasmonean, um, uh, the Hasmonean line, the end of that with Hyrcanus the second. He was uh, functioning as as high priest and had been put over Judea. And uh, and was ruling Judea un under the Romans, although he was it was seen as an independent kingdom, but he was definitely kind of put in place by the Romans. And it's obvious that the Romans are um, very much in control politically uh, in this area, um, but they aren't uh, necessarily taxing the Jews uh, um, that I'm aware of at this point. They may start. Uh, I'm not sure when exactly that that starts. Um, but they, they come in and, uh, they're there for a time. Hyrcanus is reigning and Hyrcanus is uh, right hand man. Antipater, um, is, uh, helping him reign and, and is very, uh, helpful to Caesar and, and such like that. And Antipater is Herod the Great's father. And then where we left it, uh, last, uh, last week was, uh, the, uh, Parthians had come in and invaded Judea. Uh, and they had, uh, and then Herod um, fled to um, he fled to Rome, and Rome ends up making him king. And so now he is coming back as king uh, because the um, Hyrcanus has had his ears cut off, so he can't serve as high priest. Uh, and um, and the Romans wanted to have a king there that they could trust, and so Herod is uh, made king in. Rome. Remember, Mark Anthony and uh, Caesar Augustus or Octavius are on either side of Herod as he's going in and out of the Senate uh, and when they declare him king. So, when Herod returns to retake Judea, uh, when he had left, he had put his family uh, in Masada, and he had also, uh, there's another fortress up here where he had put um, his um, his Hasmonean wife, uh, and something that ends up becoming an issue is that he had actually instructed, and this happened at two different occasions when he went off to uh, um, to a place where he wasn't sure if he would come back. Uh, but uh, he puts his um, uh, family into those. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna wait on that because I think it's when he goes up to to meet Caesar. So I'll tell you that story uh, when we do that. Um, well, basically, the gist is he orders his, his uh, uh, servants that if he happens to die, these are the wives and the sons that you kill, and these are the ones you put into place. <laughs> so they had, he had orders for which ones to of his family to be killed. Um, so he comes in to retake yeah, Judea. <laughs> he had put his family in Masada to be protected. We're going to learn more about Masada. Masada at the, this time was not quite as nice as later on. He ends up building it up and making it into an uh, unbelievable palace. At this time, it's just mainly a fortress. Um, 
And uh, so he first comes in to Ptolemais, and then he takes Galilee uh, by force. And, and now, as he does this, what he's really doing is putting down those who are opposing him, and those that are for him are helping him. Uh, and there are a lot that are for him, and uh, because he used to be over Galilee, and they were very happy with his rule. So he's really just kind of coming in, putting down rebels as he goes through Galilee. Then he has to go on to Joppa, uh, because Joppa is another larger city and he, that had um, forces at it uh, that were against him, and he didn't want them at his rear once he went to go get his family. So after he's taken Joppa, he then goes to Masada. Now, while he's uh, on his way to Masada, and I might have the wrong path there, uh, while he's on his way to Masada to get to his family, the Jew, there's a group of Jews that pursue him and attack him. And uh, when they pursue and, and attack him, he, he has a very desperate fight, but he ends up winning at this place that he later builds a palace called Herodium, and that's actually where he is buried. Uh, and his grave is at Herodium, and, and it's actually somewhere in here. So I say my arrow probably goes the wrong direction, but uh, you're, you'll see pictures of it in, in a little bit. Um, but he has this fight, and he defeats those that, that uh, try to take him. Then he gets to Masada. He gets his family, and he uh, orders his family to go up to Sebast, which is up here. Um, and to uh, be safe there and have somebody taking care of them. Uh, then he goes to Jerusalem and he besieges Jerusalem. And he goes there and he proclaims peace. He's like, there's no reason to fight, just open the gates and so on and so forth. Uh, but his enemies ignore him. Uh, and there's a Roman commander, Silo, who begins to uh, stir up dissension uh, within all of that. Uh, and this is one of the... Um, Silo is one of the commanders that would, would actually at this point be under Mark Anthony, because Mark Anthony is still alive at this point. Um, and then eventually the armies all go to winter quarters, and that kind of breaks off. So while they're in winter quarters, Herod goes down and he takes Idumea uh, and gets control of that. And actually this is when he puts his family in uh, Sebast. Uh, and then he goes up to the caves of Arabel. Or Arbella, sorry, up here. If you ever do go to Galilee, you'll see on the, on the side of Tiberius, Tiberius is right up against this big rock that juts out, and right at the top of that are the cliffs of Arbella, and there's caves up in there uh, that rebels were using to, uh, to hide and to go out and attack. So he goes and he takes care of that situation, um, and then Silo is called up uh, by the Romans to go against Parthia, so he's gone. Uh, and then Herod comes down and he ends up taking uh, a lot of those in the Jewish wilderness. <laughs> now, Jerusalem at this point has, uh, has surrendered, and then uh, he takes care of these. When he goes into the Judean wilderness, he's taking out the last remaining uh, people that are against him. Uh, one of the stories of that is, uh, um, begins to speak of the radicalism that you're going to see later on in the war with the Romans, where when Herod comes in, there's families, and he's begging the families to come out from the caves, and they're actually, uh, the parents are taking their kids and throwing them off the cliffs and then jumping off the cliffs themselves rather than surrendering uh, to them. And so they end up clearing out um, all of those caves and get the last of the forces that were against him, and he now is, is back in power. So <clears throat> Herod... At this point, once he gets into power, uh, he was a strong ally of Mark Anthony, and Mark Anthony asks him to uh, go and help him with a battle up in Mesopotamia going against the, the uh, Parthians. And so he goes and aids uh, him uh, more as a favor, uh, and, but he also wants to build up his friendship uh, with Anthony. Uh, and then Anthony promises Herod that more Roman aid will come to help him control uh, the kingdom, his kingdom. And so uh, this, you see that building relationship with Mark Anthony, but also that the, the, the point of allies with Rome or Herod is asking for Roman forces to come and to help. And so uh, these aren't things that are negatives in the sense of Rome coming in and taking over, they're coming in to help. Antigonus then uh, um, <clears throat> takes
takes advantage of Herod's absence. Uh, Antigonus is one of the other buyers for the throne through the Hasmonean uh, line. Uh, and he uh, um, tries to start up and stir up rebellion against Herod's reign. And Herod's brother, who was left in charge, Joseph, goes out to fight against him and ends up become, being killed. And Antigonus then takes the body of Joseph and dishonors it. Uh, and then he rounds up a bunch of Herod's uh, supporters and he drowns them in the Sea of Galilee. Hmm. Uh, and so then Herod returns, and this is part of why um, he needed the help from Mark Anthony uh, to bring some of the Roman forces in to put down Antigonus. Uh, and so he returns and he takes Jericho, uh, which was one of the places that Antigonus had holed up. And uh, he avenges himself in Galilee uh, first as he comes through. When he gets to Jericho uh, and defeats them there, uh, he stops and he's dining with these prominent men in this house. Uh, and right after he's done eating, he walks out and the house collapses. And so uh, some see this as a sign that his attack on Jericho uh, you know, will be successful. Uh, some see it as a, basically some see it as a positive sign for him. Some see it as a negative sign that he just happened to escape from. He defeats Jericho. He goes up uh, and retakes Jerusalem, uh, and uh, he camps against the north side, which is the same thing that the Romans will eventually do. Uh, and he destroys some of the suburbs there to build his camp. That was not a very positive thing. And now they're really questioning him about. You know, some people are, are starting to waver on any of their support for him. And so he, at this point, takes up Miriam, the Hasmonean princess, as his queen. And he puts aside his uh, wife that he had up to that point, uh, and um, uh, who was from um, the, uh, well, we'll see, she was, for, she was Idumean. Uh, and so he puts her aside, takes on the Hasmonean king. Now that he's married to the Hasmonean uh, princess, a lot of people are like, okay, he's actually in the line, this is proper, she, and so on and so forth. And so at this time, in 37 BC, when he takes Jerusalem and marries uh, Miriam, he becomes fully king, uh, and this is when the beginning of his reign. <clears throat> when uh, he does this, he captures Antigonus, he sends Antigonus up to Mark Anthony, and Mark Anthony is the one who puts him to death because he didn't want, uh, he basically wanted Mark Anthony to be the bad guy uh, in that situation rather than him. So some of the key events uh, in Herod's early reign. Uh, one, Hyrcanus Her <coughs> II returns from Parthia, but can't serve as high priest. So Hyrcanus was in Parthia, <clears throat> And uh, um, Herod had to come through and retake everything and, and, uh, and, and fight against uh, Antigonus, who had helped Parthia. Now, Hyrcanus II comes back. Now, Hyrcanus II was kind of the rightful king, but he, can't, he doesn't want to serve as king, really. And Rome's already made uh, Herod king. Uh, and Herod, Hyrcanus has his ears cut off. Uh, so that he can't serve as high priest anymore, uh, which was done by the Parthians and Antigonus to, to remove him from power. Um, and so basically, uh, Hyrcanus comes back, doesn't seek for power for himself, but he does become kind of a problem for Herod, as we're going to see. When he, uh, uh, Herod then has to find a high priest, because he can't have Hyrcanus II as high priest with, a, with the ears cut off, uh, he ends up uh, uh, appointing a commoner from Babylon. Now, that doesn't mean he was Babylonian. It was, there's a huge Jewish population in Babylon. Uh, and so he chose somebody from that population to come and to be the high priest. This ends up offending uh, Alexandra, who's his mother-in-law. So Miriam, whom he just married, her mother Alexandra uh, is... is Furious that he gets his commoner as a high priest, uh, and she feels that it should instead go to her young son Aristobulus, who is a quite a young son. I think he's he's early teens or preteens at this point, um, and so she wants that uh, to to happen instead. Herod sees the power play 
uh, trying to get uh, this young man to uh, you know, be high priest, and then, then maybe he could win uh, favor and become king. So he um, has this kid over, and they go out, and they're all swimming, and he kind of gets out of the water and walks away, so it clearly isn't him. And what happens? But the kid drowns somehow. Uh, <laughs> and so um, claims it's an accident. Alexander does not believe that it's an accident by any means. So she goes to her good friend, Cleopatra. And Alexandra, in talking to Cleopatra, uh, <laughs> demands that, she, that Cleopatra make Mark Anthony come go to Herod and discipline him. And so uh, Mark Anthony calls Herod to Egypt to give an account for his actions. This is one of those times when he uh, goes that he gives the orders, if I go, you're to kill Miriam <laughs> and, and uh, her, the, uh, their kids at this point. Uh, if I go, you're to kill them. And then the power should go to my, my sister. And his sister and his mom were in a different, they had to be kept separate. His, <laughs> His mom and his sister and Miriam hated each other. And the stuff that you hear throughout the whole thing, it, it, it would make any soap opera pale in comparison <laughs> to the stuff that happens between these women. Uh, and so uh, he has them separated, but he actually had told his servant to, to, to kill um, his wife. Now, the way Josephus says is that he wanted the servant to kill his wife because... The one reason he thought Mark Anthony would put him to death is so he could have his wife because Miriam was very beautiful and known for her beauty around the whole empire. And so he was, he thought, you know, if he's going to kill me, then he ain't getting my wife. That was really the motive from Josephus's perspective. Um, not so much, I don't want her in, in power. Uh, and, it, and so, you know, it does seem very much so that Herod did really loved Miriam in, in this in a, the way that a Herod could. Uh, but he was definitely very attracted to her. He was definitely very fond of her. Uh, she, though, once some of those things came out, was not very fond of him, as we're going to see. Um, so when, uh, when he goes, uh, uh, there's rumors that spread that Anthony had Herod tortured and killed, which is not at all the case. Uh, he goes to, to uh, Anthony and Anthony calls it into question, and Herod comes back, and, and we don't know exactly what Herod said to him, except that Anthony goes back to Cleopatra and says, you can only tell him what to do so much before he ceases to be king. So I, you know, yes, and this shows you just a little bit of the Roman perspective. It's like, yes, we have a lot of influence on you. Yes, we, we, you need to do what we want, or we can make other things happen. But you're still technically the king, and so you're king. And you see that with this here with, with Herod. Um, so when that happens, Cleopatra is not happy that her womanly wiles did not have the ability to sway him. Uh, and her friend would probably be upset. And so one of the things that Anthony does, probably to appease her, is he takes portions of Judea and puts it under Cleopatra's control uh, so that she can now get the revenues and, the, and, and such from, from businesses and such in there. And so uh, she uh, can collect taxes, Herod can't. Herod is not happy about this, but he can't really do anything about it. He, with the shakiness of what he did, he's kind of stuck uh, just dealing with this. Well then, Mark Anthony ends up going to war with Octavius. Uh, this is where we talked about that second triumvirate last week. Uh, you have Octavius and uh, Lepidus and uh, uh, Mark Anthony who are all vying for power. And it really is just Octavius and Mark Anthony uh, in the end. Uh, and they come comes to a head at the Battle of Actium, uh, which is a very famous battle. If, you, if you're a history buff at all, you're familiar with the Battle of Actium. Uh, but... Herod was actually going to send Jewish forces to the Battle of Actium to fight on the side of Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony says, no, I want you instead to go to war uh, with Arabia. Now, on one level, this is, you might say, like a godsend for Herod, uh, because 
Had Herod gone, gone and fought with Mark Anthony, he may have been killed, captured and killed, uh, or other things to that effect. Uh, and instead, by going to, to fight with Arabia, he doesn't have the direct offense of having fought against Octavius. Um, and the, this war with Arabia, though, was not being done by Anthony for that reason. He was doing this because Cleopatra wanted Herod to go and fight with Arabia. Because what Cleopatra wanted was Herod to fight with Arabia, Arabia to fight with Herod, and then to wear each other out, and then whoever was the loser, she was going to take the land of that loser, um, and possibly then vie for, for the land of the other one. So Cleopatra is very clearly angling to try to get all of that uh, eastern coast, the Levant, uh, the Mediterranean, under her power. And so uh, Herod goes and he fights against Arabia. He's successful at first, but then there's a, a really major defeat that he experiences, and he's actually very desperate at this point. I mean, he, everything is hanging on a string, uh, but then he's able to make a comeback, and he wins the war, uh, and the Arabians actually cement and come under his government uh, rather than going under um, Cleopatra because they prefer Herod to Cleopatra. So during this time, uh, we also have the death of Hyrcanus. So he's while he's fighting with Arabia uh, and having that battle, Hyrcanus was caught plotting with the king of Arabia to overthrow Herod. So in other words, if he basically Hyrcanus was going to help and aid uh, the Arabian king to uh, um, you know basically defeat Herod if his selection of who would be put in charge and so on and so, so forth would, would be put in charge. So Hyrcanus is kind of angling to have his family brought back into the power structure. Um, when uh, uh, this accusation comes out, uh, it's thought, at least uh, Josephus feels, that Alexandra was the one who put Hyrcanus up to it. But Josephus actually seems to affirm that Hyrcanus likely did actually do this, that there was evidence to that side. And, and so uh, Hyrcanus is brought up um, to the uh, Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin actually convicts him, and Hyrcanus II is put to death. And thus is the end of the Hasmonean line for all intents and purposes, because now we're under the Herodian line. Now, with Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, uh, they fell in love. Uh, we talked about that a little bit last week. Uh, and in that, uh, he actually marries Cleopatra before divorcing his wife, who happens to be Octavius' sister, which caused a whole lot of problems uh, and gained him a bad reputation uh, in Rome. And uh, let me just a quick silence this because I got a bunch of texts coming through and they're from my prayer group, so they're probably going to keep texting no matter what, what I do. So, there we go. And. Um, so uh, when, uh, when this romantic affair happens, there's a couple of things. One, Mark Anthony actually starts to dress in Egyptian dress, and he brings uh, uh, Cleopatra to Rome, and they're dressed like Egyptians and stuff like that, and that's a real big turnoff to everybody in Rome. Uh, and then he actually wills uh, a good deal of the empire to Cleopatra, and this gets found out. Uh, that that's the case. And so that's a big reason why the people of Rome kind of abandoned Mark Anthony and started to follow Octavius uh, full-fledged. And so as a result, Octavius ends up painting at Mark Anthony as a traitor to Roman culture. Uh, that's when they end up facing off uh, at Actium. Uh, and when they get to Actium, what ends up happening is Mark Anthony's soldiers just leave and go to Augustus' side. <laughs> or to Octavius' side. Uh, they want nothing to do because they don't like the Egyptian uh, presence and, and so on and so forth as well. Mark Anthony uh, and Cleopatra escape by going out to Cleopatra's ships uh, that are there, and they sail back uh, to Egypt. Uh, and in that act as well, they abandon a lot of various soldiers. So at that point, they're not going to have the legions and stuff uh, to help them. So then Octavius uh, starts heading to Egypt. On his way, at first, he meets with Herod at the island of Rhodes. So Herod is now called to go 
to the, to the island of Rhodes and give an account. Now the island of Rhodes is at the tip of Tur Turkey today. So you see, if you see Turkey on the southwest tip, there's a large island there. That's the island uh, of Rhodes. When Herod is called to go to the island of Rhodes, everyone thinks he's up for it and he's going to be deposed and, and there's going to be a new king uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, especially since he was very close friends with and allies with uh, Octavius's enemy. And instead, what happens when Herod gets there and he meets Octavius, uh, Octavius is questioning him about his support for Anthony, and Octavius said, yes, I supported Anthony, and yes, I would have sent forces, and I have been a good friend to Anthony, and I have, you know, this is all of what I've done. And he said, but I would hope that you could consider what sort of friend I have been rather than whose friend I was, and I will be that friend to you. Mm -hmm. And Octavius is like, cool, and puts him back into power and, and uh, supports him. And so this was another one of those times where Herod had told his, uh, his servants, you know, if I don't make it back, I'm kill my wife and, and so on and so forth. But it's during this time that he's gone that his wife uh, pokes and prods and pokes and prods and pokes and prods with that servant and just keeps going and keeps going and, and not quite sure what all happened there to get him to open up and, and tell her um, what actually happened. Uh, but he eventually lets on, yes, you know, because uh, I think she's saying, you know, my, that Herod doesn't love you, me, doesn't this, and he thinks he can win her by saying he loves you so much that he didn't want Mark Anthony to have you, so he gave me orders to kill you. And she's like, yeah, that doesn't compute. Uh, and so it didn't really work uh, that way. Um, now, what leads, when we talk a little, little bit about the accusations back and forth and it leading to her death, a big part of what leads to her death is Herod assumed that there's no way that servant would have opened up to Miriam that way unless there was an intimate relationship that was going on. And so that becomes a major accusation for her being uh, put to death. So what ends up happening at this point, Herod is uh, um, reinstates uh, um, is reinstated, sorry, by Octavius. Octavius continues down around the the, uh, um, the coast and heading toward Egypt. And as he's coming, uh, Anthony's armies just surrender to him. And so they begin to realize what's happening. Anthony falls on his sword, uh, and then one week later, die, or he falls on his sword, dies in Cleopatra's arm, and one week later, she commits suicide uh, herself. So that's, you know, why you see that famous Hollywood ending. Of course, they do it at the same time in the Hollywood ending instead of... Well, actually, uh, she has a, a viper fighter. Yeah, she... They, they make it a little dramatic. So... Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, uh, this now kind of concludes the... This, this is the kind of utter end of the Roman Republic. The fine... The... the, the it finally transitions now into truly being empire. Octavius uh, is the, truly the first emperor, uh, and he's master of the Roman world, uncontested. Uh, his accomplished uh, confidence earned him the name Caesar Augustus. So it's at this point that he takes this moniker of, of Augustus, which it the best way to put put it is it is a. Uh, um, it's saying you're bordering on divinity. That's basically what that word would mean. Uh, and it is where we get our word, uh, or our month, August. So July is named after Julius Caesar. August is named after Augustus. And so that's why we have those. Um, <coughs> and uh, now, as of this point, we have, during the reigns of Caesar Augustus and Herod the King, which is when the New Testament starts, we are now in the New Testament era officially. So here during Herod's uh, um, reign, the, the thing that, that is surprising when you first read about this or first go through it is that he wasn't really, um, he wasn't as hated at the beginning and he wasn't as off as he, at the beginning. Uh, but he goes through years and years of people plotting to take over his kingdom. Uh, and you may say, you know, like, well, that was just all his imagination and stuff like that. Well, 
yes, it, you could say it's his imagination, but he has this these family members saying they're plotting against you, and these family members saying they're plotting against you, and these family members saying they're plotting against you. So he's being told by everybody that he's being plotted against. He's not just this weird insecure person off the bat. They he is he has intrigued all around and gossip all around, uh, and so um, so you you catch that aspect of why he is so fearful of uh, people taking his kingdom from him. But you also would look and you begin to see as you read that he was very benevolent in many ways as well, especially in his early years. Um, so during his early years, uh, Judea had a, a severe famine uh, and he responded with benevolence. He sold most of his own luxury items, bought grain for the whole nation, uh, and even helped surrounding countries with food, uh, and even paid for the bread to be prepared for the elderly and the disabled. I mean, that's more than our government usually does for us. That's wrong. Um, yeah. uh, and so um, <clears throat> this act that he does brought a lot of people around to supporting his, his reign as king. He also was very good at controlling um, crime. So... During his reign, there was very little crime on the roads. You could you could travel and feel much safer. You didn't have to worry about being attacked because uh, if somebody attacked you, there was severe consequences and they went after you. And so he did very good on crime. Uh, he also helped many other cities recover from natural disasters. Uh, the island of Rhodes, where he had been called up to the, uh, to see Octavius, they had a major earthquake. And it destroyed large buildings and a temple to Apollos and stuff like that. And he went and he ended up rebuilding the entire uh, temple and, and most of the city. And he did that in multiple cities across the empire. Uh, he, he stepped in and financed a lot of those things. Uh, and in fact, this, is, this was the beginning of the, um, the more, uh, like the, 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 the Pharisees disapproving of Herod was um, because he had built this temple to Apollo, you know, with money that he had gotten from taxing them. So that bothered them. So just like we have that issue of our tax dollars going to abortions or our tax dollars going to things like that, that was kind of the issue. It wasn't that they, they thought he was horrible and, and, uh, um, and uh, non-Jewish, because actually he was very zealous about uh, his Judaism. Uh, in, in the different constructions we're going to see. I mean, well, obviously the biggest one he did was rebuilt the temple, which was beautiful and gorgeous. Uh, but on top of that, you, you go to the places he built, and there's always a synagogue there. He was, he was a practicing Jew, uh, mm -hmm. and um, there were many ways that he followed the law and did uh, what was required of the law, both him and his the other Herods that we read about. Um, and so uh, he also helped finance and rejuvenate the Olympic Games. So the Olympic Games had kind of gone down in their quality and everything else like that, and they couldn't get the financing. And he actually helped get, get the Olympic Games back up and going uh, in Greece. So what I want you guys to catch is, he is not just a, a small client king in Judea. He is somebody who is known all around the empire. Everybody in the Roman world knew who Herod was. Uh, there was he was not just a small name guy. Uh, one of the biggest things with that is his friendships. Uh, he was actually one of the more powerful kings of his time, politically, especially because uh, Caesar Augustus was his uh, was his closest friend. Uh, sorry, Caesar Augustus and his closest friend Agrippa were Herod's friends. Uh, this is in Josephus Antiquities. It says, and in short, he, Herod, arrived at that pitch of felicity that whereas there were but two men that governed the vast Roman Empire, first Caesar and then Agrippa, who was his principal favorite, Caesar preferred no one to Herod besides Agrippa, and Agrippa made no one his greater friend than Herod besides Caesar. Hmm. So this is a level of friendship with the two most powerful guys in the world uh, that you don't really think of. You don't think of Herod as having that kind of connection. <laughs> Um, but he did. Now he he was um, he was definitely I would say closer to Agrippa, and there's more contact between him and Agrippa. But that's partly because Caesar is Caesar, uh, and can't have uh, the same amount of contact. Um, but they they traveled together and they went places together, um, and uh, and they 
he spoke face to face with with Caesar Augustus on, on multiple occasions and such. So, um, so another part of his fame was the building projects that he did, uh, and some of them are really, really quite amazing. Um, <laughs> We're going to start, these are, so you have Alexandria and Hyrcania. I don't have pictures of, of Hyrcania, um, or um, I think I have just a few of Sebast. Uh, but Alexandria, this is the first one. When you're traveling through the Jordan Valley, if you visit Israel, you'll, you'll be able to see it. You'll see in the, you know, the next slide um, why. Um, Masada is a must go to if you ever go to uh, Israel. Herodium, I would have loved to have gone to, but it was in an area that of the West Bank that it was not safe to go to. Um, and then he rebuilt the temple. And then Caesarea Maritima is another one of his huge uh, building projects where he basically created a port where there was none. And it's still there today. That's how amazing it is. Um, so Alexandrium, uh, if you're traveling, this is a picture taken from the, the highway in the Jordan Valley. Uh, you can see very clearly this peak. And the natural peak probably would have been just about right here. All of this was added to put a fortress up on top. And this is taken from a good distance away. This is a little bit closer. Uh, you can see now that there's actually ruins on the top where they had a fortress uh, up there. Um, he then also, as we talked about Herodium, Herodium was a place that he built for his family at that location where he had had that battle. Um, <laughs> Herodion, the thing that's amazing is, is he has this, the palace oh, down nice. here and all these grounds, uh, and there's pools of water and everything, and if you go there today, this is like barren. And uh, it was definitely a little bit different in its environment at that time, um, but still it was through the ingenuity of, of having, uh, um, what do you call those things, come on, Aqueduct. water, Aqueduct. aqueducts, Aqueduct. carrying water to it. Uh, and then you have this fortress up at the top of this hill, which pretty much everything from this wall up was added to this hill. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he it, it's amazing what they were able to do where this was located. Uh, this is, you know, another view that shows an idea of how it would have been. You see all the palace grounds with the, with the water and everything. Uh, and then this would have been part of his palace as well. Uh, and uh, like a parade grounds for soldiers. And so he would have had people stationed. And you can act, this is actually seeing the Dead Sea from there. You could mm -hmm. see it if you were up high enough. In real life, this is uh, some of what it looks for. So this is that pool that they showed in the picture. Um, and so a person would be probably just about like you know, that tall here. So no more of the hill. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yep. So built into the side of the hill here, what they're finding, this is his tomb. And then this was actually an amphitheater that he had up on the hill so you could watch and performances and just have this view out of everything. Is this a recreation or is yeah. it? Yeah, okay. recreation. Okay. Yeah. And when they say how long it take to do that, build all this? Each one probably took a little bit different, but um, they were definitely all completed during his reign. So. Yeah. Uh, the only one that wasn't completed during during his reign was uh, the um, temple. So, uh, so this is another picture you can see. This is where the amphitheater is right here. He built, and that's the palace and the tomb. So this, this is an is actual picture. Here. This is actual picture. Okay. So, um, so this and this is where he is buried. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if he's if they have found his actual body or not, or if it was raided. I'm not sure. So inside, you see here, this is a synagogue that was built into the fortress. Um, and it, you kind of can see and, and grasp that he uh, was following um, the, the Judaism, the, the rules of Judaism. Yeah. So this is Masada. How many of you guys have, any of you guys ever been to Masada? Okay. Uh, I did have somebody say that they wanted to put together a trip to Israel. So if you guys are interested in that, let me know. We'll try to put one together. But I... Uh, Masada is this fortress that goes all the way up around the top here. The, this right here is the actual palace that he has. This was not there. This is what, how the Romans took it. They built a ramp um, all the way up to the top uh, and brought the siegens and engines up there. But what they were able to do engineering-wise here is amazing. 
these are different layers. Uh, if you do go and you walk along here, I hope you don't mind heights. It's uh, really scary. Uh, <laughs> but as you, this is like a, a place where they would have had a feast or in a pillared roofed room. Uh, similar here, and then up here, this is a gorgeous view from where the palace was. All through here were baths. Uh, these here, these holes that you see, those are large cisterns uh, where they had guys bringing up water. These are also cisterns down in here, and they would bring the water up this path. You'll see it in a second. And, and just have servants constantly bringing water up to it, water up to it, water up to it. And they had hot baths, they had saunas, they had uh, you know, hot tubs, cold tubs, and saunas all up in that palace, uh, out in the middle of the desert like that. Uh, this is a hot room, so what they would have done is they would have had a place where they burnt, uh, um, fired a warm steam that would have gone under these floors and warmed these floors. So this would be one of the hot rooms uh, that you'd go into. Then you had the different baths that you could go into. They have uh, this one. You don't know which ones. Um, I don't know if you could tell which ones were hot baths or cold baths. You see some of the beauty of the tile work and the mosaic. This is going out onto that um, that lowest palace level. Uh, you can see even how high that still is. These are um, like pillars built into the hillside, which is kind of cool. The other thing that you need about going to Masada is they've, they've um, recreated some of the coloration to the best that they can tell, and you can see how colorful some of this stuff was. We always picture the ruins being white and bleached, and they're actually extremely colorful. Hmm. Oh, those columns are carved in there, huh? Yep. Nice. These ones are. So this shows you the water system. So they had channels that went all the way up the hills and would bring the water down to here and it would flow into these caves that they had here which were carved out into cisterns and then so so they'd, they'd have a cave they'd go in and they would plaster the cave so that there were no cracks and it could hold the water and it wouldn't leak out um, and then servants would be taking this path and going to all these caves and getting the water and then taking it by mule all the way up to here and this this uh, water gate right here is it, it's harrowing looking out that water gate and to think that these guys had to take mules and go down all the way down it's like no that, that would have been you need to get yourself a new servant I'll just die um, but a uh, picture here they it would flow down they have these channels you can see the plaster and the rock that would go all the way down through here and the water would flow into the cistern and then that's the door that they would go into the cistern this is a picture inside the cistern. Here, so the water would flow down here, would pass through, and it would flow into this giant room. And this is, so you guys get an idea. This is, you can, you can put a Chevy pickup truck here, no problem. That's how big this is. It's huge. Uh, and uh, um, when I first looked in, it blew my mind as to how, how did they, how did they do all that? How did they even get enough water in that desert place to fill that? Uh, but that's what they did. Uh, so that was, that's Masada. Masada, um, let me go back to one of the previous pictures here. So Masada was uh, where the final Jewish stand is. We're going to hit that again in the last lesson. Um, but this is where he had kept his, his family. And this is where 900 and some people, when, they, when the Romans finally built this ramp up and succeeded in, in taking the wall, they got inside and found not all 900 of them dead. They'd all committed suicide uh, rather than submit uh, to the Romans. Um, and there's some interesting things when you go there that they they may have found the things that they used to draw the lots, the names of who would kill who kind of thing. Uh, and that was a very common thing to, to commit suicide rather than be captured by the Romans. So then you have um, Caesarea Maritima. Uh, so he built this to honor Caesar, and this is on the Mediterranean Sea. This area that would go out here to, to the left would be a palace that he had built right on the sea. Uh, this um, forward, this was a horse race track, uh, basically, and these are all of the stands that went out. And uh, so you'd sit there and watch a horse race with just that beautiful ocean view 
uh, behind you. Uh, further up into here was more of the city, and uh, out going in here, this, these are rocks that he placed to create a port uh, there on the other side of that. This is, by the way, where Paul lived for two years when he was waiting to be sent to Caesar. Uh, and the book of Acts tells us about that when he uh, um, then has his interviews with Herod Agrippa the first, and uh, no, Herod, sorry, Herod Agrippa the, uh, the second is where Paul is, who Paul interviews with here. Um, on the other side of that, a little further north, <coughs> is this aqueduct. And this aqueduct carried water all the way from Mount Carmel to this city. Uh, and it, it still, I mean, think of the construction that this thing is still standing today. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes along the beach at that. This is the theater that's there. Uh, at the right, this is, this is a line, if you can't tell. This is just some of the statuary that's been found to show you kind of the, the high class of it. Um, but this theater, you'll see this again uh, in a couple weeks when we get to Herod Agrippa, actually next week, because uh, this is the theater where Herod Agrippa dies in Acts 12. So you can stand right where Agrippa the first was and, and see what he was looking at when he realized he was going to die. Um, and uh, but this also, this is a the theater is amazing to see its construction and, and um, how much went into it. And then he also had built up the temple, which uh, also built up Jerusalem while it was at, he was at it. These towers here uh, in the background, um, they are built by Herod, and uh, they're, they're named after his, his relatives. Like Phasilus was uh, one for his brother, and then uh, what was it, uh, Antipater or whatever. But he, I can't remember, but they, they're named after his, um, his relatives. Uh, and he built those uh, where would be the main kind of the main entrance into Jerusalem. Uh, the temple he built. When it came to the temple, he wanted to uh, improve it. And basically the Jews said, you can't do anything to it until you have all of the stuff ahead of time. And so he actually bought and, and paid for all of the materials uh, all the way down to the, to the last thing and... and did that before they ever started redoing it. Uh, and that's part of why it did not get finished while he was alive, because he had to wait till he had all of those things made and then he started uh, to do it. Now this is a model that they have at uh, um, I think the Jerusalem Hotel, uh, and, and it is it is a neat model. The problem with this model, as you look at it, is that, again, it looks all white stone, and this would have been very colorful. Uh, it would not have been uh, like this. You would have seen, you know, colorful draperies and and you know shades and everything on here, but the buildings themselves would have been more colorful uh, than what you see here. Now this here is uh, um, what today is, I think, Herod's sewer, uh, and it became covered. Uh, I think that's what it is, unless it's this. But you have um, uh, this is the pool of Siloam and the. Hezekiah's tunnel flows into this, uh, and then, um, uh, so he built up all of these things and improved them. Uh, some of these, these things, this right here would be the Hasmonean palace that he improved, but it was already there. His palace that he built, uh, from what we seem to have, was here along the uh, west side uh, of, um, of the city, and after Herod the Great uh, passes, this becomes probably where the Roman governor uh, would have stayed or been when he would he would come in. We don't know exactly, because when it talks about the palaces, there's a, the Hasmonean Palace here, there's the palace he builds, and there's other structures in here, and it's hard to keep them straight. Um, when you look at uh, the temple in this model, uh, you see this wall right here on the other side of the temple. This is the Wailing Wall. So if you go there today, the, the Wailing Wall that, uh, what's the other name for it? The, the Wailing Wall, there's the, I'm not going to remember. Western Wall? Western Wall, yes, the Western Wall. Some people don't like to call it the Wailing Wall, but the Western Wall is here. Now, uh, if you look at this line, oops, right here, this is where 
the ground level would be if you go today for the Western Wall. Uh, you'll see it in this next picture. You see those arches right there. And so you walk out on this. So down below you, while you're standing at the Western Wall, is actually another, you know, almost 60 feet <laughs> down. Uh, and you can go down in there and see other parts of the wall and touch parts of the wall and such like that. But like when you're when you're walking around Jerusalem, the parts that Jesus walked on are well below you. It's below everything that's rubble that's been filled in and, and stuff like that. It's not the exact same streets uh, that used to be there. Um, and in fact, the Kidron Valley, after the number of destructions that Jerusalem had and so on and so forth, and after all of this current, or after Herod's Jerusalem got thrown into the Kidron Valley as the Romans tore it down, the Kidron Valley is almost 60 feet shallower than it used to be uh, when David used to be there. So, um, yeah, that's that top part. Now this picture shows uh, um, Herod, when he built it up, he had to build up this whole section, and he built uh, this platform, uh, which was massive. And, and so the construction that he had to do was, was required engineering and landfill and everything that would have amazed us. Now the, the bridge that you, that you see, the, are those arches next to the Wailing Wall, would have been to this bridge here, uh, which was a bridge from the upper city over to the temple. Uh, and then you had the stairs going up here. I don't think the wall would have been quite so grand and high as what we see there, but it, it was very high because this was the exterior wall. Uh, and at the time of Jesus, this was the exterior wall. This upper wall that you see here um, was, was not there. That was built uh, later, but here it's still strengthened all of these, built his palace up in these areas, these, these towers. Uh, and when you begin to realize these walls like this and then this giant wall here on the north side, because this was where the land was actually straight. Everyone here, it's like this up to the walls. Here it's flat to the walls. And so it was a very strong wall that was there. Uh, it would have been very difficult to take and it was not something people looked forward to taking, especially since it had its own source of water inside. The temple itself, there's a lot of different efforts to uh, portray it. Uh, I feel one of the biggest uh, problems you get is the <laughs> just it's impossible to do it in the glory that was clearly there um, and from what it was described. Now, these lampstands that were in the court, you know, they, they showed the little things to climb up. I don't know what they used to climb up, but they were very tall, four very tall lampstands that gave a great amount of light. Uh, into that courtyard. Uh, and so uh, it was equipped um, for even night service. This would have been the court of Israel uh, or sometimes the court of women. You go through here to the court of men and the court of priests would be even closer. And then this is looking into the, um, it's actually looking into the temple and seeing the veil before the Holy of Holies if, uh, when you look at that. Now, the size of his temple was 100 cubits square, according to Josephus, in the front. So when you looked at the front of it, it's uh, a cubit, is basically about a foot and a half. So this is 15 stories tall and that same amount wide. And according to Josephus and other accounts, the entire front of it was plated with gold. So not just parts of it. And carved in cedar uh, all the way down and all around the entire front of it were vines and pomegranates and branches and everything that had been carved out of cedar and then covered with gold. Um, and so when Jesus, for instance, uh, is saying, you know, I am the vine, you know, you are the branches, uh, there's some that feel that conversation is happening as they're walking through the temple courts and he may be pulling from uh, what you see there. You have the two large bronze pillars uh, and then the doors were 60 feet tall. So, and they took 20 men to open them. Uh, that's how heavy they were. Uh, which is, you know, when we get to the, the right before the war with the, the Romans, or at the time of the war with the Romans, they found the doors open and no one knew who opened them. And the idea of somebody secretly opening 60-foot doors that take 20 men to open was not likely. Um, 
This was all gold inside the vestibule uh, was gold. So what you have, this is actually, this part right here was the opening to go into this big atrium vestibule. Uh, and then you had, uh, through that, you had the doors into the holy place. And then through that, we had in the holy place, you go up into the holy of holies. Um, the holy of holies, by the way, as is described, was actually up higher because you went in and there was a series of stairs up into the things. And so the holy of holies would have been up higher. But the holy of holies actually seems to be very skinny from the description of, uh, um, uh, which you see in Josephus. So when we look at like so some of these models, I guess this one's good enough. You can see the back kind of looking skinny, but it may have even been skinnier than that if you go by actual uh, measurements. Storerooms were all around it. Um, and, uh, and then that's an altar. By the way, this right here is the height of a six foot person uh, in front of it. Um, a lot of times when they show this, they show, you know, inside this area being just wide open and bare. But there seems to be, from the way that the battle works out and the way they describe it, there seem to have been actually multiple buildings all in there, meeting buildings and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so I don't know how open that courtyard area actually was. So that's the major construction things he did. One last thing here, the, um, this arch, you can still see it today, the, the beginning of this arch is there. And then this, if you guys remember from the Temptation of Christ, and uh, when we talked about James, uh, this, I believe, is the pinnacle of the temple that where Jesus would have been put on top of and say, throw yourself down uh, and let all the people, you can see, let all the people see that happening. So, so now what we're going to get into is... Uh, what happened when Herod died, um, and well, in the rest of the rest of his life, but kind of the downfall of that. Uh, this is a chart that you guys have, uh, and it kind of tracks a lot of the stuff that we're going to be going over and, and say covering in the next section here. Um, a couple of things uh, just to bring out and show you guys that you can notice from the chart. Um, <clears throat> he had multiple wives including two here that we don't, we don't really know much about or what their, happened with the kids. Um, so he has Doris, who's his first wife, his Idumean wife, and Antipater, who we're going to talk about in just a second. So this was his kind of firstborn son. Uh, and then he put her away to take on Miriam uh, and had two sons with her, the Alexander and Aristobulus. Uh, and then the rest of these are just secondary wives that he had. Uh, that he married, whether by agreements or, or um, you know, sometimes you would marry for the sake of a treaty. Uh, but you'll notice he had one that was the daughter of the high priest, uh, uh, Simon Boethus. And then you have just Cleopatra, who's just of Jerusalem, so we don't think it's the other Cleopatra. Uh, and then Malthake, who, who was actually a Samaritan. And Herod Antipas, who ends up being, who's the one that kills John the Baptist and stuff like that, his mom was actually a Samaritan. Uh, and so, um, and then the others, we don't know uh, anything about them. But you can see there's kind of like, he's got an Indian wife, a Samaritan wife, a uh, wife from Jerusalem, a Jewish wife, and then the royal wife. So he kind of had all his, all his relationships covered politically uh, there. Now, the other thing to catch is this intermarriage. So you've got uh, Alexander and his wife, uh, Glaphyra, end up... Uh, um, when Alexander killed Glaphyra, goes over and ends up marrying Archelaus. Uh, Aristobulus uh, is married to Bernice and has Herodias uh, and Herod Agrippa. Herodias goes, ends up marrying, well, first Herod Philip, then Herod Antipas, and then she has a daughter, Salome, who ends up here, uh, marrying um, Philip, Herod Philip. So there's all this intermarriage going on uh, of half, half, um, Half-sisters, half-brothers, and things like that. So it's very interesting to see that that was so acceptable uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, which one of the interesting things, too, is Herod Agrippa ends up, when you read in the book of Acts that Herod Agrippa arrives in uh, Caesarea Maritima with uh, Bernice. Bernice is his sister, but it was rumored that they were married. Or not married, but had that relationship. 
Um, and then Drusilla, who is mentioned in that, we'll get to that next week as well. Drusilla was also um, Aristobulus' um, granddaughter through Agrippa the Great, and she's married to Felix, the governor that Paul is before. So Drusilla and Felix yeah. and Herod Agrippa II uh, and, um, and Bernice all actually sit and listen to the Apostle Paul uh, speaking to them and sharing the gospel. So it just gives you a little bit of a tie into some of the scriptural places where they intersect. Hmm. <clears throat> so here you have the death of Mary and the Hasmonean. What happens? So this is where things start to go wrong. Uh, so 29 BC, uh, Herod's sister uh, and his Idumean wife, who cannot stand Miriam. Miriam, by the way, she's very beautiful, but she was also a total snob. And everywhere she went, she just looked down her nose at uh, Herod's first wife, treated treated her like crud, treated that whole family like crud. Uh, and um, she consistently and openly insulted them publicly. Uh, and so they had this scheme against her. Um, to, uh, to try to get her out of the influence that she had on Herod. And so they're, they are the ones who begin to claim that she has had an affair uh, and that she has been unfaithful. Um, and that's when he begins, Herod looks into it and finds out that one of the servants had shared about his order to have Miriam killed and then says that must have been uh, um, due to the intimacy they had. So clearly she did commit adultery. Now, one of the weirdest things, and this is what I tell you, what a show this would make, is right when Miriam is being condemned to death, her own mother gets up and starts to rebuke her and slam her for her infidelities and so on and so forth to make sure that she doesn't get tied up in this whole mess uh, and everything with Herod either. So her own mother abandons her in the end. Uh, and then she is led away and put to death. Now, after she is put to death, Herod, uh, it's, it's recorded that Herod would go walk around the palace calling for her. And he actually went into a very, very dark period at this time because after he killed her, I think he began to realize once his anger was gone that the stuff that was given to him wasn't good evidence. Uh, and, and so it just, you know, but to make things worse to, with that though what Miriam when she found out that that had been the order she was like totally she was a she she was a jerk to Herod she started treating him with total disrespect uh ignoring him and uh they were no longer she she wouldn't sleep with them she wouldn't do anything anymore and so it really it almost fed that whole thing um so in 29 BC she's put to death and uh that uh is the beginning, I think, of Herod's mental issues. Uh, then you go on a little bit further, and what happens to the two sons through Miriam uh, is that uh, they are accused by Antipater and Herod's Idumean family that these two sons are, are plotting against them. Now, these two sons have been sent to Rome. They are actually growing up in Caesar's household uh, next to all of Caesar's kids and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so they're, they're there in Rome. And so there's all this stuff being accused. And so Herod, <clears throat> on multiple occasions, uh, asks Caesar, you know, can I kill my sons? Because, <laughs> you know, it's like they, they're, they're plotting, they're this, you know, and there's, and Caesar actually, it's, it's Caesar Augustus who intervenes between him and his sons on a couple of occasions. Uh, and, uh, and so there's, there's, um, um, serious issues with that. Uh, and Herod, um, actually at one point, uh, he had gone to Caesar, he had, uh, and Caesar interceded for his sons. The sons were like, no, we would never do that for such a great father. And you know, why would we, you know, and it seems very genuine and, and it seems like everybody's all reconciled. Um, but then there's this rumor that comes out against uh, Herod that he had gone into Arabia and attacked Arabia without permission and you know killed a bunch of people. And it was completely untrue. 
and Caesar is turned against him uh, for a little bit, uh, and so he 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 backs off. He doesn't you know he doesn't know what to do. But then then it's thought that did the sons have something to do with that? How did that happen? And there's, there's still all this. He's being told left and right. Your sons are plotting to kill you. Your sons are plotting to kill you. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, he has the two sons strangled to death for their plots to to have him killed. Um, interestingly, having had them strangled to death, he then had them preserved in honey and brought to Jerusalem so he could bury them. Um, and uh, that's actually just a small little side note. Honey is actually one of the best ways to preserve something. Mm -hmm. It works better than anything, like oil, whatever. Honey. I actually had a kid out in California that did his whole science project on that. And you put something in honey, and it doesn't... It's got natural antibacterial yep. properties, and they used it in wounds in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a little bit sticky to use as you know antibacterial all the time, but uh, yeah. And then you end up licking your fingers and you get sick. <laughs> um, so uh, the air, what airs there are then? So what you know that's that's what happens with his those two sons. Uh, those two sons, once they were born, they were the heirs. Now originally. Herod had said it's going to be these two sons and Antipater, my firstborn. But then those two sons were, were all upset, like, how can you think he's equal to us? That's no way. And then, so he ends up removing Antipater, which that is part of why Antipater had it against the two sons and uh, wanted to have them out. Well, once they were out, uh, then the next heir was Antipater. Um, and uh, <clears throat> when um, Antipater takes on this this position uh he seems to do well he seems to you know does not seem to fall out of favor with his father until uh the end he ends up as re being removed uh as heir right before herod dies and and from the time of the the um from the time of the death of the two sons which was 7 a.d from that time on herod's not there I mean, if you look at the decisions he makes, uh, he's, um, you know, constantly going back between this son and this son. I mean, he has uh, orders that if something happens to him, these sons are to be killed right away. These, here's all the people you need to kill if I die. Uh, and it's, it's amazing that, that he goes that way. When you read about him at the beginning of his, uh, of his reign, you don't have that sense at all that that's the way he is. He actually has much more balanced judgment and, and a lot more benevolent responses to things. Where in the, after he kills his two sons, it's like nothing's going to hold him back. Um, and so you know, 7 BC, that's three years before the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. And so you take a, you know, when, well, let me get through this, then we'll talk about that in a second. So basically, uh, Herod's, um, Herod's, um, first wife gets taken back once uh, the, the uh, um, Hasmonean bride was killed and she now becomes the, the primary wife again which is part of why she had done that and then she puts Antipater forward and helped Antipater uh, to uh, get Herod to kill the two sons Antipater now uh, is heir but he falls from favor in five BC, so about two years after the other two um, are um, taken out. Then <clears throat> it goes to Archelaus and Herod Antipas. And really Herod Antipas is the one that, that Herod picks first, and, uh, and then Archelaus was going to, um, uh, would be after Herod Antipas as uh, the one that's chosen. And Herod Antipas ends up being the one capable son of Herod, really, the one that is most capable and, and such, uh, even though he's the bad guy by far in the New Testament. Um, then, toward the end, those two kind of fall out, uh, it, it seems, and Herod Philip comes in as an option, but he's still kind of behind it, and there's multiple wills that Herod's writing. So he's, uh, when he does finally die, there's this debate as to which will to go with and how they're supposed to do it, and so on and so forth. So in his final years, he becomes nearly insane with jealousy and insecurity. Uh, and uh, at this point, Caesar as well is asking, you know, I want to have control of Arabia 
too, because he already had a great deal of governance over it, but he wanted it officially recognized. And Caesar says, no, I'm not going to give it to you. And the biggest reason is he saw how old he was and just how in disarray his household was. Um, and so then he begins this witch hunt against his sons that he has left uh, that he doesn't trust because he thinks they're all, because he doesn't get that approved, that he thinks they're all scheming uh, for him. And while he's worried that all of his sons are trying to knock him off because he's getting old and they want his kingdom and so on and so forth, this is when these guys show up and go, hey, did we saw this star in the east and there's this guy who says he's king of the Jews. <laughs> in a little different context uh, when you see it this way. You begin to realize uh, the reaction he gives is not that far from what you would expect from a man uh, like that. Uh, and so it's uh, here it turns um, you know against uh, Antipater. Uh, it's especially powerful because he feels that in, he now he's at this point he's convinced that Antipater lied about the two sons um, and remembers that role. Uh, and so right before Herod dies, four days before he dies, he has Antipater put to death. Uh, and, uh, and then he dies. Now Herod had actually had orders that uh, prominent Jewish people were to be killed to make sure that somebody was mourning on the day of his death. Uh, and uh, sometimes people can be pitiful people. <laughs> just really bad. Um, and then uh, Archelaus um, puts on this glorious funeral. And Archelaus was probably kind of vying for power here. And he's, he's definitely the worst of Herod's sons, who has the very worst qualities of Herod and none of the good qualities of Herod. And he, uh, he probably, um, you know, was knew that he was second after Antipas and was doing a lot of stuff while his dad was unstable to get his name in there. And then he tries to step out as the main person by putting this funeral on. The funeral for Herod the Great was intended by Gauls, Celts, or Celts, and Germans. In other words, I want you guys to catch this, how far away in the empire people knew Herod and sent people. So this is the, from Germany, England, and France. They're coming to be in his funeral. Um, and then he ends up being, he's buried in the tomb on the uh, side of Herodium. At this point, Herod's heirs and competitors go to Rome to vie for power. They're each bringing different, you know, asp uh, copies of his will or and such and claiming things. <coughs> Archelaus' cl uh, claims uh, are based on Herod's last will, and Tipter's claims are based on the prior will. This is what kind of tells you that, you know, Archelaus was pushing his dad to make another will and doing what he could to get into it, whereas Antipas was like, no, this was what the will was supposed to be. Uh, and the, the, there was also a group of Jews who just went to Rome and said, we don't want any of them. <laughs> we just want to have a Roman governor. Now, I want you guys to catch that. They're asking at this point that to have a Roman governor over them. Uh, not, Rome does not step in and go, we're just going to put a governor over you. They have asked to have one. Uh, and uh, and so they actually don't put the Roman governor over them. They put Archelaus uh, oh, as ethnarch over Judea. Um, let me just go to the map. And we'll talk about the rebellions in a second. So Archelaus becomes ethnarch of Judea, Samaria, and Edomia. Herod Antipas is made tetrarch of Perea and Galilee. And Philip is made tetrarch of Etoria and Trachonitis. Um, and so... Uh, of these three, Archelaus does horribly uh, and is deposed quite quickly. I think two years. Uh, we're going to see in a second. Antipas is very capable and does pretty well. Uh, and Philip is capable and does well. He's just, he just wasn't ambitious and, and not as scheming, so he wasn't as interesting to write about, so we don't know as much. Um, so with Philip the Tetrarch, he's not Herod Philip. Herod Philip is the original husband of, uh, come on, boy. original husband of Herodias, that she divorced him to marry Herod Antipas. So that that's who Herod Philip is. Philip is just straight up Philip. He's just Philip the Tetrarch. And he, uh, as we said, was over Galilee in that northern area. Uh, he, uh, 
<clears throat> his capital was at Panion. Uh, so you, how many have you been to Israel? Just one of us here? Did you go to the cave of Pan and up at Caesarea Philippi? Not Caesarea, but I don't remember one of those caves. Okay. It was it's not necessarily a cave, it's, it looks like kind of the beginning of a cave. There, there, there was a cave there that used to have a giant hole in it, but they've filled it in now. Um, and it was seen as being the opening to the underworld, and it was a place then where you worshipped Pan. And Is it the headwaters of the... It's by the headwaters of the Jordan, yeah. Okay. And uh, so Caesarea Philippi is, is founded by Philip. Uh, and so he goes and he builds that, names it Caesarea in honor of Caesar, but it's called Caesarea Philippi because it's the, the Caesarea that Philip built, whereas Caesarea Maritima is the Caesarea that's on the sea. And so they're building all these cities and naming them after Roman officials to honor them uh, because of the close relationship they have. Uh, he also rebuilt Bethsaida, uh, which means fisher town. Uh, or House of Fish, uh, as a winter residence. Uh, and Bethsaida is where some of the disciples are while he's the one who is wintering there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, this is the, the tetrarch that, that many of the disciples would have been under. Uh, he did not face a lot of the difficulties of his brothers because he just wasn't, he wasn't aggressive and scheming and, and everything else like that. He was, he, they said he seemed to be a quiet man. Uh, he was known for just doing the rounds of, because he would just travel to different places and judge cases, and he, would, he seemed to be a good, just man. There was nothing uh, about him and that was like the evils of Herod or killing people off or anything of that or controlling, and everybody in his region actually liked him as a ruler, and there was very little people that rose up against him. So uh, he actually was a decent um, ruler. Uh, he died while at his winter palace in AD 34, which is right about the same time that Christ uh, um, goes to the cross. Uh, his wife Salome, widowed by her uncle, uh, marries her cousin. So she was, so she had married her. Salome had married her uncle. Uh, he dies, and then she marries her her cousin. Uh, so they just they they're really into this intermarriage thing. Now, when you ask, why would they do that? They're doing that because of the ancient uh, world's uh, emphasis on power and power in certain families. And so these women, they're not marrying because this guy is so handsome. They're marrying because that's how they're going to be powerful. That's how they're going to get in with the person where they still are having the life amongst all the movers and shakers in the Roman Empire. They didn't want to marry out of that or they would lose all of that. And so that's a big reason why they... they married with him to keep that, that uh, power structure. Um, and then <clears throat> Philip's territory at the time of his death is placed under a legate of Syria. So it's, it falls under Syria and they have somebody that's under the governor that's in Syria that, that watches it. Eventually it's gonna come under a Herod again, under Herod uh, Agrippa. We'll see that next week. Herod Antipas, uh, <clears throat> he was the ablest of, the, of Herod's sons when it came to just governing and such. Um, not very good at choosing, you know, wives because he he marries his cousin who was married to his brother who was, he's just, you know, I was, I was going to make a joke like sounds like we're in Kentucky or something. But I, don't wanna, I don't want someone from Kentucky to get all mad at me. So uh, <clears throat> anyways, um, so he builds Tiberias on the western shore of Galilee. So if you do go to Galilee and you see that town that's on um, I'm sure it's the bit largest of the towns on Galilee. Uh, that was built by uh, Herod Antipas during the time of his reign. It was just a small little village prior to that. Um, he was avo avoided by Jews initially, uh, the town was, because it was built upon a cemetery, and so it was seen to be unclean, but then it later became a center of rabbinical teaching uh, after the life of Christ. Uh, and then uh, Galilee soon became known as the Lake of Tiberias rather than the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so during his reign, there were no open revolts, um, and he was informally called king by his subjects. He did not have the official title of king from the Romans, but his subjects called him King Herod, and that is why some of the Gospels also follow that and list him as a king. Uh, Mark and Matthew refer to him specifically as King Herod. And then he was married to Herodias, 
Uh, she was the wife of Herod Philip, not the Philip over the other ones. Just, they, they just wish they could get creative with their names <laughs> or something. Um, uh, they fell in love while Antipas traveled to Rome with Herod Philip. Uh, so they, the two brothers were traveling, and uh, it was actually on the island of Rhodes that where they stopped that Antipas and uh, um, Herodias hit it off. And next thing you know, they're in this romantic uh, um, whirlwind of a, of a relationship into Rome, and then she divorces uh, Philip and, and uh, uh, Herod Philip and marries Antipas. Uh, and this is what is condemned by John the Baptist uh, and ended up costing him his life. Uh, Herodias's mother, Bernice, uh, she was the daughter, <coughs> daughter of Herod the Great's sister, uh, Salome, and bosom friends with Antonia, the widow of Drusus, brother of Emperor Tiberius. So her, basically, Herodias's mother was best friends with a very powerful woman. Uh, uh, so you, again, you can see that the family is all intertwined with the very highest echelons of Roman society. Uh, Herodias' brother, Herod Agrippa, who becomes Herod Agrippa the Great, which we'll study next week, uh, he actually uses Herodias's... Um, uh, Sorry, calendar. <laughs> he actually uses his, his sister's marriage to uh, Herod Antipas to advance himself, which is part of the reason why he ends up advancing himself and being called king, and Herod Antipas is still a tetrarch, and he gets all upset about that and complains, and that's when he actually ends up getting deposed and his kingdom gets given to Agrippa, uh, which we'll see that next week. Um, Herod, <coughs> Herod Agrippa, um, during this time period, uh, becomes friends with Gaius Caligula, the uh, future emperor of Rome, the son of Germanicus. He was called Caligula because it meant little boots when he was a little kid. They dressed him up in a Roman uniform <laughs> with all these little tiny pieces to, to the weaponry and he had these little boots so they called him little boots and that became his nickname and that's what Caligula means is, is little boots um, and uh, he's Herodi Harry Agrippa so her, uh, uh, is the one who ends up executing James the disciple of Jesus so that gives you some of the connections there uh, with Herodias and then that's a double and then uh, Archelaus he was the one that was over Judea and and such he was hated by his own family, who tried to prevent him from being king at all. Uh, which, again, tells you he was plotting with Herod, trying to get into the will, and so on and so forth, and they saw all of that. Um, and uh, Herod, at the end, in that final will he had done, actually had Archelaus having the title king, but Augustus did not uh, give him that. He gave him the title ethnarch. So if you look at it, it's like Tetrarch is like quarter king, Ethnarch is like half king, and then king is full king. And so he got half king, and his two brothers got quarter kings. Uh, and now all those made up for you know, a full whole of the Judean uh, Jewish nation. Uh, he married Glaphyra, uh, who was the wife of a deceased half-brother Alexander. So, I mean, he, even he's marrying somebody else's wife. Uh, and uh, the Jewish wife prohibited the marriage, and yet, you know, that one doesn't... Uh, um, well, it didn't, it didn't last long enough to be able to be condemned by uh, John the Baptist because he was booted out of the country and sent off to France. Uh, and so he lived out his days uh, in Vienna. Um, and when it's interesting here that you know, both Jews and Samaritans asked for him to be deposed. Now, what's significant about that? That's like the Democrats and the Republicans asking for him to be you know, deposed. The Jews and the Samaritans agreeing on something was pretty significant. And uh, Caesar Augustus knew that, and so that's why he deposed him. When Archelaus is deposed, now we have a Roman governor put over Judea. Uh, now we're going to talk next week about um, then what was, who those Roman governors were leading up to a certain point, and we'll talk about uh, Herod Agrippa II. All right. Any questions you guys have? Go close with that with Biden. <laughs> I, 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 I do have to say I make my jokes back and forth. I'm pretty I'm pretty politically politically neutral, but you know I don't see any options right now. I'm not scared of so it's just not not good. So. But questions about the lesson? Any? How many guys? How many guys say that was that was the first time you've heard that stuff about Herod? Mm -hmm.
That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And a little bit different than, than what we typically picture him as. Uh, I know for me personally, I always saw him as a much smaller time king, uh, not very important. And I also uh, had no idea that he had a time that he'd, he was actually well liked. I thought he was just like evil from the get-go, like Archaeus, but it, he, uh, he was actually very well liked for a good amount of time. And I had no idea that uh, he was so well known around the Roman Empire. I mean, he was very well known, so he and his whole family. Yeah. If the upper ruling class of Judea was such, was so tightly in, intertwined with Rome, how do you explain the portrayal of the uh, Romans and the Judea as a whole as being at odds the way it's often depicted? Because people don't know history. Uh, if you read in scripture, it's not depicted as being you don't go through scripture and see the Romans as these bad guys. Scripture does not put them out that way. We we have brought that in. I know that's what I'm asking. Um, yeah. What what was what would be driving that? I think um, the, I think there may have been times when there was more of a move to put the the onus of crucifying Christ on the Romans, and then and then you go through the whole issue of the cross and. And, you know, avoiding putting any of the onus on the Jews at the time, because that became very offensive for, for periods. Uh, and so then you have all these sermons that talk about these Romans and what they used to do and how brutal they were. And, you know, and honest, honestly, it's just, it's, it's what we, it's what we come to when we're trying to do sermons when we don't know history. And that's why it's been that way. Okay. Um, so you didn't, I don't know that. I don't know how the Romans were portrayed by like reformers and things like that prior to um, just because when you, when you get to America, the separation of church and state allowed for the church to have people manifest as teachers who didn't know what they were teaching or didn't, had not studied. They hadn't gone to seminary. They hadn't done any of those things. And they were going to scripture and having these tent meetings and just thriving on everybody loving what they're teaching and because they could speak really well and speak really powerfully. Uh, they would do that and you had these great awakenings. Now, out of the great awakenings, you had some really solid teachers. You had some really wonky teachers. You get Joseph Smith. You get, you know, uh, the, the Seventh-day Adventists. You get, you know, everything all over the place. Um, but one of the things about the second and third great awakenings that's uh, important to grasp is many of them were not theologically educated and did not know the history. So much of what they were teaching ignored that history and they went off in their own teachings, especially end times teachings and things like that, and were taking all these passages and saying these are talking about this and this is talking about this and this is talking about this. Well then the, 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 the ministers who had an education were getting up and going, you don't know what you're talking about. It's like, this is, if you know the history, if you know this, this is what it is. And, and it's like, yes, you haven't even been to seminary. Well, what ends up happening is those, those denominations, uh, which is what they became, developed this culture of being anti-seminary. Uh, and I grew up in one of those. I, I grew up where seminary was called cemetery, where you go for your faith to die. Uh, and uh, if you had too much of an education, you were, you, you were seen as useless and, and what was really glorified and magnified was when you'd get up and preach and didn't have seminary. That was so, so great. But because you didn't have a law that could come down and say, you're teaching wrong doctrine, we're going to put you in jail like they did in England and Germany and everywhere else in the world, these teachings were able to just propagate. And so in America, there is a great deal more theological teaching that lacks any sort of historical understanding and background. And we have propagated a good deal of our own teachings that I call evangelical oral tradition. Uh, and the, the dastardliness of the Romans is part of that evangelical oral tradition. Uh, that we just have this sense about the Romans and this is how we feel. And so we portray it that way in our movies. We portray it that way in our books. We portray them that way all the time. It's not even a basis for it in, that, in what we're talking about at the level we are. They don't ever show the friendship between the Jews and the Romans 
uh, you know, so much. And it's just um, the, so I think that's where a lot of that comes from. It's just that popular repeating of each other's words without actually knowing the background. But that's one of the reasons why I have my, my pushback against, you know, just reading all these different books within the church, because many of them are just taking all the stuff that they've heard from preaching. They're taking it for granted and they're just repeating it over and over again. And, and no one's reading the histories and just reading the stuff to learn the background to know if that's even accurate. Uh, we're just all reading all these other books and regurgitating that stuff. So. Would you say the biggest part of Herod being so paranoid is because of the families vying to have power? Yeah, and I will say, I don't think he was crazy being paranoid because they were vying for power. And there were many trying to do those things. Um, because each one of them were vying for power against each other. The question really is, is, were they vying to take him out or not? But they definitely were vying for power under him, trying to get this one out and this one out and accusing, but we don't have a way to fully prove that any of them truly plotted against Herod himself. So he may not have been paranoid at all. He may have been just fearful. He may have just been smart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what... What happens is, so after he kills his wife, um, the paranoia, uh, I, what, what really begins to happen is, is, is like the who do I trust? Mm -hmm. And that, that what seems to be the case is that circle of trust starts going like this for him over the years to where he gets to the end and he trusts no one. Um, but prior to that, he had people he trusted and that were good friends with him. So, but I mean, here, Caesar once said of Herod, you know, it's it's uh, safe. You know, it's safer to be one of his pigs than one of his sons, because mm -hmm. as Jew, Jewish, he would you know didn't mm -hmm. kill a pig. <laughs> so. But he had the Ten Commandments. So why did he have his wife kill and his child children kill? Well, the Ten Commandments. Also, you know, if somebody commits adultery, you take them out and you stone them to death. Yeah. So if he thought she committed adultery, he probably felt totally justified in going into that. So, yeah, the, well, the children, the plotting against him, that's, but that's, the children are, you know, three years before he dies. It's three years while he, right. he's already in that bad, bad place. So, yeah. Um, with his kingdom and David's kingdom, both of them didn't choose a heir and, heir and tell everybody who that heir was. So they were all still vying for that because mm -hmm. by both of them not making a choice and saying this is the person then they both had to deal with all that and arrest in their family. Right, yep. And, and I think after the two, when, when the two sons were alive, it was just the two sons. And so there was that stability that was there. Uh, and that's what, one of the things they say in their defense when, when he brings them before Caesar. They're like, why, why would we plot to get the kingdom we're going to have anyway? <laughs> you know, we're, you know, that's why are we doing that? And, uh, and, and what they're trying to bring out there is like, if somebody's plotting, it's the one who doesn't get to get the kingdom, which is probably your other son. Uh, but they weren't in a place to throw that accusation out, and they didn't. Uh, and the two sons seem to have been relatively humble and actually were quite scared when he brought the one accusation. Um, and, uh, but it really, that's after he had already killed his wife and there's just certain things like if, if I did that and I believed these people, I have to keep believing them because otherwise I did something horrible. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. thing. I think that's what messed with his mind a lot. So I just, I, um, I, I, I don't think he was a good man and did in any way like that. He was definitely a, a very harsh ruler, but that was the case around the entire empire at that time. Um, he was not seen from from what we uh, I read. He wasn't seen as, you know, just recklessly so. He was just a very firm. You did you broke this law, you're you're going to um, be put to death. So he, there there was that. He had no problem with the death penalty, but he does not seem to go on rampages uh, during his early years. He does not go on any rampages to take other people out. Uh, um, I think the very first one you see is that one kid that they have drunk. Prior to that, he, he didn't have that tendency. And uh, 
you know, and he claimed, you know, that that was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but basically what I'm trying to get to is, is I really feel that the, the really terrible Herod we typically portray was only the last 45 years of his life. The rest of it, he was a much different king, uh, much better accepted by the Jews than what we typically say. Anything else? All right. Good week.